Ephesians 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. We've got 60 years, but this church goes back a lot further. We've got 60 years, but this work goes back a long ways. We've got 60 years, but God's been doing this kind of thing since Acts chapter 2. Aren't you glad to be a part of what God started and he is continuing? I'm so grateful that it's being built. It's being built on that foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together. All the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. There's this building project that we've been a part of, that God is in the midst of, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, that this Holy Ghost that we long for when we gather together in a room, that, that that moving of God's presence that we search for and reach for and call for and pray about and that we preach for and that, that we gather together in a room for, that Spirit of God does this work in us together. That's why I need you and that's why you need your neighbor and that's why you need the person across the room is because God is building this building and it's fitly framed together. We're not here by happenstance. It's not just luck that we all landed in the room God's got us all here on purpose for an end time revival that we get to be a part of God's still building God's still building I'm so grateful that God's working going to call this message building project phase two building project phase two would you pray together with me God more than just being inspired and excited about what you can do God, we are praying that you would do everything that you have promised. God, let somebody sense the reality of what they're a part of. Let somebody see in their supernatural eye. God, not a church building and God, not just a group of people, but this entity that you have ordained. God, that you have anointed. God, that you have compiled and conglomerated and God, you brought us together in a congregation to be a part of what you're doing in this end time harvest. I pray, God, let somebody see that. God, let somebody have a revelation that they're a part of it. They're not just attending it. They're not just observing it. But God, they are a part of what you are building in this day. Let that reality rest on us tonight. God, let it compel us to become what you're calling us to be. We ask it in your splendid powerful precious name would someone just speak the name of Jesus for a moment I feel him moving right now and I sense him just kind of touching the heart I I think that maybe you already got what you needed in the room the spirit of God's just minister but we did just reach for that for another moment come on just a little higher a little louder come on a little more come on just a little more intentional for a moment Would you just clap hands to the Lord as you're seated? First Peter 2 and verse 5 says, Ye also as lively stones. I'm so glad that you participated with me. Because you are lively stones. You are built up a spiritual house. An holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We're lively stones. Uh, I'll just tell you, church was never intended to be a dead spot never intended to be just a quiet room. It was never intended just to be a group of people that gathered that listened to a pleasant speech for a few moments and left the same way that they came in. But the church is a lively spot. The church is a birthing room. The church is, is that, that place where all of a sudden something happens around the altars and, and new life comes out. That is where the church began and that is how the church is going to continue. It was preachers who they thought were drunk in the Holy Ghost. They, they just kind of said, 
Why, how in the world are, are they acting the way that they're acting? It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. I'll tell you how. When the Holy Ghost touches, something moves on the inside. You act a little abnormal. You get a little unusual. You step outside the frame of what's intended or expected. And you begin to let God move. I'm telling you, we're in a lively room tonight. We grew up in churches, come on, and this is one of them, where people moved under the unction of the Holy Ghost. We grew up in churches where people did the unplanned, where people did the unexpected, where we did what pastor said, uh, find me a key because we're about to sing a song. Song show operators tense up. Pro presenter people get all out of order. They, when the, I look back when pastor did that, they were just... What are we going to do now? Because when the lyrics don't show up on the screen, everybody turns around and looks at them. They're all looking over the screen. That was this morning. Brandon texted me and said, do you know what songs you're singing? I said, I have no idea. Some golden oldies. Old school. Old fashioned. Like 60 years ago when everybody was summoned through the hymnal trying to find out where the song leader was because he just grabbed the book and got a song and began to sing out of the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. I'm glad. I'm glad for what we've got now, but I think we might be able just to use a, a little bit of where we came from for a few moments because the enemy's already got a game plan for how he's going to interrupt and distract and deter. Can I just remind somebody the devil doesn't know what's going to happen when the Holy Ghost moves in and we act under that unction? He has no idea that's what happens in a lively church. I'm way off my notes. It happens in a lively church. <laughs> Building project phase two. I'm, I'm excited about, I, I should have, I didn't, I didn't even know what number we were on as far as building projects. I could have said building project phase 32. I should, I should have said maybe building project 56. I don't know. As long as I've been here, there's been a hammer in one hand and a Bible in the other. As long as I've been around, we've had, <laughs> we've had nails and screws and screw guns, and we've got two-by-fours laying somewhere. There's something going on in some area of the building because when, you, when you've got a campus this big, then you just kind of you move from one end to the other, and by the time you get to the other end, you've got to go back. I've been here long enough to tear apart the stuff we built because it was too old, out of date. So I don't know what building project we're on. I, I do know that we're all in this room because there's a building project going on over there. And we're excited about it. We should be. Partly because it's one of the last major areas we're going to tackle for a while. <laughs> I think I just saw Eric Porter run pack the best. <laughs> And all the church said, amen. <laughs> but we're also excited because soon and very soon we're getting back into the sanctuary. And that allows us all a little bit of normal in the midst of all the abnormality that's going on in our world. Or at least our neighborhood right now. I'll just settle it this way. Building projects are normal around here. There's always uh, things that need to be done. As a matter of fact, I... I, I just began to think while I was preparing the message and I wrote on the whiteboard, the roof over the office needs shingles this year. The parking lot isn't getting any better. The foyer needs an update. We could go on. There's all kinds of building projects that we've got. And that's part of God's plan. If you look from the Old Testament, the book of Nehemiah was about rebuilding. Ezra was about rebuild, rebuilding. There's, there's all of that through the word of God because buildings like this matter. This represents who we are. It's a picture of what God has produced in our lives. It's a place where we come and we gather. Well, what we just heard in that song that moved us all so deeply because, because that's a reality. This, those kind of things happen in rooms like this. And so we, uh, we place a great deal of attention on our buildings because they're not just our community centers. They're the house of God. They're sanctuaries. 
They're places where God's presence rests. It's, it's a place where God moves. And so we have to be, uh, we have to take care in how we do it. I, I'm grateful that, that pastor's a bit of, perf- of a perfectionist. I can't even get the word out. I can't be it. I can't say it. I'm, I'm glad that Pastor Matt is a chip off the old block. Not calling Pastor old. I'm glad that we've got people with that, that attention to detail. I'm grateful for that because this is the house of God. And there was a twofold instruction we find in Psalm 127. The, the word says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. And some people take that verse and they, they exclude our responsibility. No, we have a responsibility. We are the ones that labor. We labor. But God does his part with us. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. The psalmist was explicit in instruction. There are two elements to every construction project when it comes to the house of God. There's the natural element, but then there is the supernatural element. There's an effort on our part, but then there's that effort on God's part. When God begins to do the work. And, and we all know, we've got Peter's revelation. He said... Uh, Uh, that, That Jesus said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We all know that God is going to be engaged in the building project, but that doesn't isolate us. We have a responsibility as well. This isn't just wood and metal, blood, sweat, and gears, and tears, construction. It's all of that with a whole lot of help from the Holy Ghost that comes our way. We've got all kinds of decisions to, to decide and work to complete, and, and, and we've got all kinds of things that we're engaged in, but it's more than just a physical construction because except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. I'll tell you what we're doing. We're doing our part, but we're preparing for God's part. Everything that we're engaged in right now is that we're making room for what God is about to do. We're making room for what God is about to perform. We're making room for the new life that God is about to infuse in our church. We're making room because we want our community to know, you know what? You come. We're ready for you. You show up. We're prepared. God wants to work in your life, so we're ready to see what God is about to do. We can work on buildings all by ourselves, but we can't build a church because a church is bigger than a building. The good news is, it's just what the psalmist said, except the Lord build a house. God is intent on building this church. So my question for us tonight is, if God won't do this alone, what am I doing to help him build the church? Can we move beyond the mortar and steel drywall and two by fours can we move beyond all that for a moment and think in the supernatural realm building phase building construction phase two what are we doing to push the church forward what are we doing to grow God's church let's bring it a little bit closer to home someone ask yourself tonight is there anything that I could be doing anything that I should be doing to build God's church We, uh, we talked a little bit about it in the series in January. Believe, understand, intercede, love, dedicate, build. It was our keynote kickoff to the brand new year of 2021 as we desperately tried to leave 2020 behind. As we desperately moved into this brand new year, we talked about build because there was Framing, uh, there was staging all over the platform, and then they were getting ready to do all that new framing, and everything was happening. And we, we just said, you know what, let's talk about building, how God's building the church, and how God's building us. And, and can I just remind us tonight on this dedication service, this reminder of 60 years of what God has done, this memorial moment that we're all a part of, that God is still building the church. The buildings mean a lot to us, but can I remind us that the buildings mean a lot to us, not because of their construction, not because of of how they were built or who they were built by or who they were built for. They, They mean a lot to us because of what happened in those buildings. 
It's, it's those buildings. That what, what, what is so endearing to us and why we're moved when we see those photos and those pictures is because those buildings are where we were moved by the hand of God. It's where God poured out his spirit in our life. It's where God filled our children with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's where God uh, was in that room when we had that dedication service of our children. And we remember what God has done. It's not the construction of the building. It's the work that God did in the building. It's the work that God did in you. That is the building part of the church that matters the most, except the Lord build the house. So if we're looking at building project phase two, can I remind us that everyone matters? The number one thing to remember in church building is that everyone matters. Everyone Luke 15 and verse 4 said, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. How many sheep did he go looking for? How many, how many did it take to go on the search? So it was one-to-one ratio. Do you realize that everyone in the room can impact one? That everyone has a commission to reach one? That everyone here tonight, as we take a moment and we glance around the room, I, we'll get into it in a minute. But one of the, I, I've said that because it's, 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 it's just this, trying to weigh my words. It makes me mad that we can't all be together. So, so we can look around the room and we don't know whether one's gone or not because they may be out in the entryway. They may, they may not be in service this week because they were in service the last three services, but, but somewhere along the line we, we lose sight of the one. The one. The one goes missing and we don't notice because we've got, we don't have our church family together. The flock's divided. That, that, if there's anything about coronavirus that I hate is that it brings division. It's a separator. It's an isolator. It's, it it, it kind of it creates this, these walls and, and these little barriers and bubbles. But it only takes one to reach one. So the part of, commi- part of the commission tonight is that everybody can be a part of this building project because it just takes one to reach one. It takes one. It says that there's <clears throat> joy in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over the 99 just persons which need no repentance. We are celebrating being in this room together. But God is looking for someone that's concerned about the one. The one. Heaven's waiting for the celebration because it says there's just one not here. Someone is missing from the celebration tonight. And does anyone notice? Is there anyone in the room that, that realizes, hey, I haven't seen so-and-so for a while. Hey, I haven't, I haven't noticed that, that this person, they, they were coming. They were doing really well, but somewhere along the line. And, and I can show you text messages that I've sent during coronavirus because I get worried and I get concerned about people that have been missing. We're searching. Not, I'm grateful for the 99 that are in the room tonight, but there's still an ache in our hearts tonight for the one that's missing, the one that's wayward, the one that's outside the fold. The one that should be here but isn't here. Is anybody worried about one tonight? Is anybody worried about one? It gives us a picture of the enemy because I'll tell you why I don't like coronavirus. It's too much like the devil. It's just it just brings division, it brings death, and it brings all that, all that garbage. And, And John referred to it. When he's talking about the good shepherd, he said, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep and flees. And listen, the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep. The scattering happens. 
we're living in a scattered world right now. We're living in a world where society and community is, is, is nothing like what it was. We've been scattered. We've been separated. We've been isolated. And some people, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're, we're in the middle of all that. We've got this division that's happening. People are divided in their opinions. And I, I'm not laying mine on the table tonight because I don't want anyone to get mad at me. And we don't need email and hate mail and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm still glad that we're somewhere in the middle. We're getting shot at from both sides. It's a safe place to be. I like what Brother Tenney said, you need both wings on the bird to fly straight. You need right wing and left wing. We get some people that think we need to open public places faster for our social and economic health. Some people feel like we need to shut everything down for our physical health. We've been wrestling with what society has stated it needs to be the new normal. We've got wars raging on the social front. We've got race divisions. We've got people pointing fingers at planet, uh, across our planet and at other countries and blaming people. Some people are saying liberals are the problems. Others are saying conservatives are the problems. We've got division, division, division. We're scattered. And we're divided. And God help us if we allow this to divide us. God help us if we allow what's going on because the last thing our world needs, our scattered world needs is a scattered church. The last thing that our world needs is a divided church. We better sort it out before we leave the room. Not mad. If you don't agree with me, I can still love you. If you don't agree with me, I don't need, I, I, you know, we, we don't need to be shooting one another down because we got, we got missiles going up from one camp and missiles going up from the other, and the fallout is killing somebody in the middle. So we need to stop fighting within ourselves and bind together on the purpose that binds us together. We've got a world that's scattered, and God's saying, is there anyone that's willing to reach just one? Is there anyone? We can't forget who the real enemy is. It's not you, and I'll just tell you, it's not me. It's not pastor with his wise words. (laughs) He got sent forward to this image. He's been made into a meme now, or part of one. I don't know if anybody else saw it. Haters going to hate. People don't like church. Oh, now I'm picking sides, aren't I? The pastor said no. No, no, you're not. Let's remember who the enemy is. You ready? Finally, my brethren, not brother, brethren, this is all of us. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devils. For we, not you, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't be mistaken. Somewhere behind all this division, somewhere behind all this discord, there's a devil at work and he's somewhere laughing because if he can get the church divided, he can ha- his job's half done. But I'll tell you what will happen is if the church begins to worry about everyone, if the church begins to worry about who we are as God's believers, as God's voice, as God's light in a dark world, if we begin to worry about that, then we begin to put the devil on the run. I'm ready to wrestle. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to wage war against a devil like that. Point your fists in the right direction, church. So we have all of these elements that are scattered around our world. We've got a scattered world. But can I just remind somebody tonight that God is the master of the scattered. He's still the one that's able to look at the mess and pull a miracle out of the midst of all that. He's still the one that's on the lookout for the one that's missing. You see, every one of us are a part of this building that's fitly framed together. And God knows that we need every one to be the one to be a part of this church. That's why Peter said that this promise was unto us 
to our children and to all that, someone say it, are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Because God knew that this church was going to have people that were scattered near and far. But even though they were afar off, the promise was, was still going to come to them. I'll remind us tonight, our building project is everybody in our community. No matter how close or how far they may seem to be to this calling that God has on their life. Because he already said to those that are afar off, you pick the person that's the farthest from God that you can imagine this promise is for them this promise is for them he's still the master of the scattered as a matter of fact in Amos 3 God is warning Israel of the enemy's intention he said therefore thus saith the Lord God an adversary there shall be even round about the land and he shall bring down thy strength from thee and thy palaces shall be spoiled it's a grisly picture of what the enemy would seek to do not just in ancient Israel but today's church it's a grisly picture about how the enemy attacks in this story, in this verse, the enemy has attacked the sheepfold. The lion has attacked the sheep. But don't miss the heart of the shepherd in the midst of what seems to be a bad story. Amos 3 and verse 12, he goes on. He said, thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and in Damascus in a couch. So just a few things to note about this verse. Number one, the shepherd ha, has hunted down the lion. The lion may have got into the flock, but the shepherd went after the lion. And he didn't stop until the lion was just in his sights. He didn't stop until the lion was in his hands. I'm going to guess that the shepherd and the lion had it out. I'm going to guess that you just don't walk up to a lion and haul out whatever it's eaten for dinner. But the heart of the shepherd said, you know what, lion? You picked the wrong shepherd to do battle with. You picked the wrong shepherd to take the one from. You picked the wrong shepherd. And the lion goes down in defeat. And the shepherd walks away knowing that the adversary has been defeated. Number one, the shepherd has hunted down the lion. Number two, the shepherd has overcome the lion. And number three, the shepherd has retrieved the lamb or whatever's left of the lamb. And let's be real, sometimes the world doesn't leave a lot left of the lamb. We, we look at somebody and we say, ah, it's a pity, it's a, it's a horrible picture, it's a, it's a bad story. There's nothing left but a, a few legs, there's nothing left but just a little bit of ear. But can I remind everybody about what God can do with a little bit? Can I remind everybody about what God can do with just a few? Can I remind everybody about five loaves and two fishes that God just needed placed in his hand? And he can multiply it until the crowd is fed. I'll remind everybody it doesn't matter what's left, whatever's left is enough for God to use. It's a part of the building. The other half of Dr. Luke's lesson of the lost is about the woman who loses 10 pieces of silver. But it says if she, sorry, she has 10 pieces of silver, but she loses one piece. Let me, let me just remind us what she does. She, she, she gets the candle out and she lights the candle and she, she gets the broom out and she, she begins to sweep through the house because the one that is lost has got to be found. You say, oh, she's got nine left. That, that should be enough. Nine pieces of silver. I'd take nine pieces of silver right now. But let me tell you what she does. She begins to go on the search through the room because sometimes you're lost in the house. Sometimes you're lost in the very room and, and you just got, you got a, a preacher that preached to us in the last couple of weeks uh, about what God could do and, and how God is looking, how God is searching, how God's working in the middle of the mess that we're in right now. You know what God's doing? He's searching for you in the room. His spirit is sweeping the room and, and God is looking and God's kind of, he's got the, the light of the word out and he's, he's shining it into our lives and, and all of a sudden just right there in plain sight was the one that was lost in the room. We didn't realize that they didn't, they didn't look very good or, or they just kind of were going through the motions. But, but the Spirit of God reached them 
where they were. I, I don't know where you are in the room tonight, but, but can I remind you that God is reaching for you and he knows exactly where you are. The Spirit of God is working in our midst and the, and the hope that God has for somebody is that by the time that God is finished, you won't just be lost in the room. You won't be just part of something that's, that was, that could have been. You will be a part of what God is doing in your life. The one that was lost in the room. I, I know sometimes we get look and we, we have to assess all of our assets. We've got to take a look through what we've got. The reason for inventory is so that we know when things get lost or things get stolen. And, and sometimes we just kind of sit down and say, oh, how long has it been since so-and-so was here? Or I'm a little worried about how people are responding in service because you can get lost in the room. You can already be in the house, but somehow you still get lost. But it's in those moments that God begins to do a deep clean. God begins to look. God begins to search. And before long, right there in plain sight, you thought you were just hiding among the stuff. You thought you would never become a part of what God was building, but, but God found you. It was just a simple message from simple preachers. But, but all of a sudden, the Spirit of God begins working on you. And you, you say, you know what? I, I got courage to make some changes that I've got to make. I, I've got courage to become something more. I, I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm lost right now. I'm lost. And sometimes... God allows his church to become that. It's, it's the building project. We got the building, but, but sometimes it's the people that God is reaching for. Sometimes it's the people that God is sweeping the room bare. He's getting rid of, of everything that's in the way so, so we can see clearly. We, we just need to know that somebody is lost. Someone has got to be reached by one. It was the discard pile. It was left to the inevitable end of hopelessness, but God found you where you were. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You showed up and you just thought you'd be insignificant. You showed up and you thought, well, I'll, I'll just kind of slide in the side door and I'll leave before anybody notices. But the Holy Ghost found you where you were. You were discarded. Yeah, everybody else said uh, it's a hopeless case. Everybody else looked past you. But God saw where you were. And God saw what you could become. God knew where you were. And that's why he let his light shine in the midst of darkness until you were found. You see, in whom all the building fitly framed together. It has all kinds of parts and pieces that none of us would imagine would be useful. Jesus knows what it was like. He was that stone that was rejected by the builders. The stone that was rejected, it was overlooked in the building project. It, it was overlooked, as a matter of fact, all these little parts I, I got for the lesson tonight. I just went into the discard pile, Martin. I don't know if Martin's here or not, but I'm telling on myself. I went into the discard pile. I told the guys I'm going to be moving around. Maybe it's a family and they don't know which way to turn right now. But God, God's got your number. God knows exactly where you're living right now. Amen. Amen. God knows all about your house. God knows all about what's happening in your home. God knows all about it, but he, he just wants someone to know you're part of a building. You're part of a building that's fitly framed together. You don't even realize it yet, but you're a part of God's church. You, you thought you were insignificant. You thought, oh, I'm just in the discard pile. I'll just do my little thing. I'll do my little part. But I, I, I just want someone to know that God sees you. And he said, oh, no, don't, don't, don't discard them. Don't, don't miss that moment because there's somebody that God has his hand on and they're going to be a part of something greater. They're a part of a building that's fitly framed together. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment of what God is doing. Can I, can I put this together? Can I take a minute? Or maybe... Josh, you have a mask on. Can we stay six feet apart and do this? Where's Josh? Come on up here. So Josh is... Uh, we're proud of Josh. He's in his whatever block for carpentry, he ought to be able to get this finished. The only problem is he's got to go by my plans. Okay, Josh, 
that one's going to go in there, and that one's going to go in there. And put that together for me. <laughs> okay, wait. He, he's got a bruised thumbnail. It's a true sign of a carpenter. Yeah, that, that's pretty good right there. Now we'll put that one right there. He's laughing. <laughs> It's like, I will never forget. You're part of a building fitly framed together. Job. I need you right now. I needed someone. Hang on, hang on. Here we go. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Got this. Church construction is messy sometimes. <laughs> Church construction gets a little confusing sometimes. Oh, it gets a little noisy sometimes. Sometimes when you're, you're working with imperfect people, it gets a little, little sideways sometimes. It, it doesn't, oh, how in the world is this ever going to go together? How is this going to fit? God, what do you, well, I'll just tell you, maybe sometimes even on a leadership level, we're like, God, what are you doing? What are you doing with them? What are you doing through them? How are you working? But somewhere in the middle of all that, because, because we found the one that mattered, the one that was overlooked, the one that, that nobody imagined could be a part of this building project God said called the church. But here we are on this beautiful spring evening, and God is fulfilling his purpose and his plan in our lives. We are becoming the church that God has called us to be. We're not a perfect church, but we're a perfecting church. And it takes every single one everyone that was lost everyone that was out of order everybody that was in the wrong place the wrong space but it's somebody that God said is going to become a part of my church oh Josh that's awesome let's put the finishing touch on and before long all of the garbage before long all the refuse before long of the parts that everybody else overlooked as unusable, as unpart of not being a part of the future of God's plan. Can I just let us know that God takes all of that and out of it comes a church. Out of it God grows a promise. Out of it God says in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit and the imperfect becomes a part of the perfect plan. Mine a part of God. God is still building his church. God's not finished. I'm excited. I'm excited to be a part of the new sanctuary. But I'm even more excited to see the one that shows up because somebody brought them into the house of God. I'm excited about the one that we're going to sit down across the table from in a Bible study. And the unction of God moves and tears drip off of cheeks because of God's power and God's presence. And somebody realizes my life is so much bigger than I imagined it could be. I get to be a part of an end time Church, come back to the music if we would. It was a great privilege to baptize Brian this week. The enemy, he's, he's, he's very transparent about it on Facebook. But can I just let everybody know the enemy was very intentional about trying to destroy Brian's life. But somebody, Tammy, invited him to church. Tammy White. And he shows up to a service. And actually, first he was watching us online. She's kind of checking us out, and she said, she said, you may want to see this video of this guy playing this song. And I hope I'm not talking about anything that Brian wouldn't want me to talk about. She said, he's Kathy's cousin. I said, Kathy, you have a cousin I don't know about? She said, well, there's Brian. The little backstories that Kathy's grandparents have been very very much a part of Brian's mother's life and, and we've been at grandparents funerals together never connected 
been there as family and didn't really get to know. And somewhere in the midst of just being overlooked and God brings one person. And it's a midweek service when nobody expects it. That God fills Brian with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he's baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins. And he goes down in a watery grave of baptism and rises to walk in newness of life. And now he's a part of the church when nobody expected it. When the enemy thought for sure it's just a discarded piece. It's nothing that nobody wants to be about. God says, wait a minute. He's a part of my church. I just need somebody to be the one that will reach one. Could we let that conviction move us for a moment? Could we let that conviction rest on us? Because you can. You can. You can be the one that can reach someone. You can be the one with a hand extended. You can be the one that could just say, you know what? I'm praying for you. And then pray for them. You could be the one that says, I notice that you're upset. I, I notice that you've been, been just kind of discouraged. I, I, I read your post. I saw your picture. I, I'm so concerned. I, I'm, I feel so bad for you. Care a little bit about somebody. I sound like I'm mad. I'm not mad. Just looking for, helping us to look for the one. We're just trimming the wick a little bit. Because the candle's got to burn brighter than it ever has before if we're going to find the one. We're just, we're, come on, we're just cutting the bristles on the broom a little bit because we've got to sweep like we've never swept before if we're going to find the one. Somewhere in the house, somewhere in the midst of everything that's gone wrong, somebody is waiting for one person to reach them. So trim your wicks, light your candles. Grab your brooms and start sweeping. Our community has somebody that's waiting for you. Come on. We need to be searching and looking and finding the one. Stand out on the step, Dad. The prodigal's coming home. Be on the lookout, Mom. Get ready to run. Somewhere on the horizon, the prodigal's going to show up. Get ready to run. They're going to need someone. Somebody is waiting for you to be the one. I'm grateful for the size of our sanctuary, the capacity that it that it represents. I'm grateful for everything that is happening in there right now. I'm grateful for new chairs. New carpet. I'm grateful for technology. But can I remind us that every seat represents somebody that we need to reach Come on, we already do. We just realized we can go to multiple services and you still show up. That means that if our building will seat 1,000 people, we can put 3,000 people in that church in one single day. We can have an Acts 2 every single Sunday. We can do it. God can do it. We can impact our community. We can impact our city. We can impact our world right from here. But it only will happen if someone will reach one. Our next building project isn't, come on, it isn't 10,000 square feet. Our next building project is a two-by-four table at Tim Hortons where we sit down with somebody and tell them about what God can do in their life. Our next building program, maybe sitting at Starbucks with someone to tell them that life isn't hopeless because there's a God that brings hope. Would you stand together with me?
And I believe with every fiber of my being that God is going to do it. And I believe even stronger with every fiber of my being that God is going to do it through you. Come on, tell your neighbor, God's going to use you. Come on, tell him, God's going to use you. Tell him. I mean, get a little grip behind it. God's going to use you. God's going to use you. If they're in your bubble, poke your bony finger on their chest, just like Sister Mangan would. Tell them, God is going to use you. Tell them. It's the old Phillips, Craig, and Dean song. The team knows I am nowhere near anything on my notes. song we used to sing, he believes in lost causes. When common sense would just give up, he believes in lost causes. Changes people with his love. There's nobody too far gone. How many know that God believes in lost causes? We just got to find the lost cause. That's all we have to do. That's all we have to do. Can you pray together with me in this room that's so filled with a challenge in the Holy Ghost right now? Spirit of the living God, would you allow that challenge, God, to rest on someone tonight? Lord, our communities need you. But you need someone that will go to somebody. Lord, I pray that every person would leave with somebody on their mind. And somebody would be reminded about a conversation. And God, that they determine right now that they're going to reach. God, not with their ability, but God, with your ability. God, our, our church is wonderful and it's beautiful and it's the product of 60 years of diligence on so many people's part. But God, how, how much more do you want to see the next years until your return filled with a continuation of what you've begun? God, lives that are impacted and changed by the power of your spirit. Homes that are redirected and turned around. People that are that are loved that never felt love like this before. Father, I pray. Move us with your compassion. God, let us love with your love. Lead us to the lost, we pray. In your name. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Would someone thank God for what he's going to do? Would someone thank him because he's going to redirect lives? He's going he's to bring hope into hopeless places. I love you, Jesus. Do my part to, to win that. 